All right, how you guys doing today? Come on, that was weak. You guys can do better. All right, all right. Now I feel like I'm at a con. It's crazy. So, okay, that's a dental service attack right there. It's not staying up. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, so uh, my name is Amar Lakani. Uh, that is actually how you say my name. Um, you know, my sister's name is Sarah. I was asked, like, Dad, what the heck happened? Like, couldn't, could have named me something easier. Um, you know, he always told me, he's like, I named you after a player uh, in Pakistan when, he went to the, when, we, when they went to the World Cup. I was like, that's great, man. I love soccer. And he's like, no, not that World Cup. The Cricket World Cup. And I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> so once you watch cricket, you'll probably have the same idea that I did or the same thought that I did is, uh, why can't they just play baseball? Seems a lot easier. So guys, my, my name is uh, Amar Lakani. Um, I am a hacker by trade. That's what I do. My job really is to find threat actors, find like what motivates them, and really find like the logic behind those threats. Um, it's my job to really kind of understand the coding behind those threats, and then kind of work with machine learning and systems to see if we can protect against them. So obviously, I'm a, I'm a hacker by trade, and I'm a ninja in trading. I know it doesn't look like it, but I, I do study Krav Maga. And they say always, like, introduce yourself and tell them, like, an interesting fact about yourself. I discovered during COVID I'm a smoker. Uh, I know that's a weird thing to say, uh, but um, I love barbecue, and I started, like, uh, getting, I got a smoker, and it was pretty awesome. All right, that was the only joke I have, and my little niece told me, please do not tell that joke, uh, but I have to. So uh, I've, been, um, I've been in the security industry for a little bit, and like I said, um, you know, my main job is to, to track threat actors. I was pretty surprised when I, when I started my current position, and we get a chance to work with a lot of uh, law enforcement and other agencies, that how organized some organized crime is. I know that sounds kind of weird, but like some organized crime units, they actually have like the equivalent of account managers that have to sell in a certain quota of like threat or crime as a service. Um, they even have recruiting events. I've seen like uh, threat actors have recruiting events and like actually like offer more money to other attackers saying, hey, come work for us. And that makes attribution really hard because you used to be able to like look at like coding and stuff and like attribute threat actors, but since they're all recruiting and moving around everywhere, uh, it, gets, uh, it gets a little difficult. But we always hear about like how sophisticated attacks are and how you know, badass some of these threat hacker groups are. I'm not sure if I can say that on, on video, but I guess that's fine. But uh, um, you, you know, I've, I've learned something about the internet, and I don't know if you guys know this or not, but people lie on the internet. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you know how I discovered this, by the way, is uh, online dating. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know if you have ever used a service like Match or uh, Harmony or uh, even Tinder, right? But um, people are not always honest about their profile pictures, right? I mean, I wish they could be honest like me. I mean, my profile picture is pretty honest, I feel like. I mean, I know, I know, I did cut my hair, right? right. We all look better from the side profile, but, you know, uh, that's, that's okay. But the internet lies sometimes on, like, kind of scaring us on, like, what threats are out there, and really what we need to do about threats. And I kind of want to show you how easy it is to do a threat. And I have to be a little careful here, but I'm going to call this the hello world of hacking. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically do a reverse shell. Has anyone, you guys all know what a reverse shell is, I'm assuming, right? OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a really basic reverse shell. I'm uh, going to take Adobe Acrobat Reader, the install program, and I'm going to insert a reverse shell into it. And this is pretty much real time, right? There's no, uh, uh, you know, there's a copy and paste uh, right here. But besides that, I haven't sped this up or anything. Uh, everything is uh, pretty much real time. And I've renamed this program evil.exe. Yeah, this is not 100% how you do it in the real world. First of all, you wouldn't have a private address on here. You do, you do a couple of other things on here. But as I said, this is really the most basic way I can think of an attack as well as I've called this evil.exe, right? So you would think that everyone would like detect this attack. This is not even a real attack. Every AV is going to you know, trigger against this. And you would hope that would be the case. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload this to VirusTotal. Now, uh, just in case if anyone doesn't know what VirusTotal is, it's a Google run you know, website, kind of like a Google run website that has about 70 different security vendors on here. And it scans against these vendors to see if they detect this as a problem or not. 
Now, this hash has never been seen in the world. It's not a zero day by any means, but it's a brand new attack that hasn't been seen in the world before. And when I scan against this, you will see a lot of red here. Red is a great thing, even though this attack hasn't been seen before. These vendors are kind of picking up the logic. Maybe they're looking at some other things. There's, uh, so it's a good thing. Now, I actually am <laughs> stopping this video early because if I scroll down, there's going to be a lot of green on here. And green is not a good thing. Green means basically they, they, they saw it as, as clean. Now, I don't want to call out any vendor because, first of all, guys, virus tool by no means is a comparison tool, and you shouldn't really be using it as a comparison tool. But I do recommend to people, like, try your own attacks. When I talk to clients, I go, what is the last attack you saw? They're like, oh, I saw something like six months ago. I go, cool. Let's see if it, who picks it up. If it doesn't get picked up, that's a problem, <laughs> like six months ago, right? So, uh, so I always tell people, like, try these attacks. But it always kind of makes me wonder, when we talk about, like, AI, next generation, all these, like, advanced attacks, when we're still not picking up the most simplest attacks, that can be a little scary. And today, that's really what I'm going to talk to you about, is from a little bit of from our IR teams on some of the most successful, but at the same time, some of the basic attacks that we see. And... Uh, and maybe a few new things that uh, you know, we're seeing as well. So why, why do attackers, I shouldn't say hackers, we should say hackers is a good thing, right? Why, why, should, why do attackers attack, right? Um, you know, they ask Willie Sutton, I'm sure this has been used in a thousand security conferences. You know, they ask Willie Sutton, why does he rob banks? And he's like, well, that's where the money's at. I'm actually going to show you conversations. I, I get to do a lot of ransomware <laughs> negotiations. It's sad, like everyone pays these days. Don't, don't pay if you don't have to. But um, I, I do ask these ra ransomware groups, like, hey, why are you doing what you do? And they're like, first of all, because everyone pays. Second of all, because it's so damn easy. <laughs> right? And I'm going to show you how easy some of this stuff is. Um, so most cybercrime, and I know we got the state actors, we got like, you know, cyber, cyber war happening. We, we're in a little awkward time. But most threat actors are financially motivated. And uh, you know, that's why I think we see a lot of ransomware attacks, a lot of phishing attacks, uh, because they have these significant immediate impacts to businesses. And these toolkits are very, very easy to come across. It doesn't take that much, uh, you know, that much uh, to get to some of these toolkits. That's why we see ransomware attacks, and all service attacks, phishing attacks, um, impersonation attacks. I want to talk to you about uh, something cool that I started seeing uh, uh, in 2020, and really even this year, I uh, started seeing a lot of this. It's called ATM jackpotting. Has anyone heard of that? Okay, a couple of people. Um, so it's run by groups like out of North Korea called Beagle Boys or Fuzzy Bear. And sync is part of it. No, just kidding. These sound like boy bands to me or something. So what, what is ATM jackpotting? Really, it's where thieves install malware on ATM machines. And basically, the malware is designed to dispense huge sums of cash. Now, I, I saw that Breaking Bad episode where they're spending all episodes uh, trying to get into the ATM machine. Right? The ATM machine to get into the cash box is very difficult. To get to a USB <laughs> a service port is usually very, very easy. Um, now, I know I'm not the only one with ATM machines in, in his garage, uh, or maybe I am, but, uh, but I like messing around with ATM machines. It kind of makes me feel like uh, you know, I'm, I'm making something of my life. <laughs> and, uh, and I imagine there's a lot of money in there, although most of my money is Monopoly money. Um, I still get asked at like, Target and Walmart, why am I buying like, like 30 boxes of Monopoly? And I was like, I need the money. <laughs> Now, it's been around for a while, but um, it really started um, mainstream in the U.S. around 2018. But I've got to tell you, around 2020 and even 2022, I've seen like, just a lot of large attacks around this. Um, basically, what these cash crews will do is they'll go around like, different ATMs, like around a city, maybe hundreds of ATMs. They'll like, they're like, OK, at you know, 435, we're going to hit this ATM. And once they do, it's a one and done deal. They've already set it up beforehand. You know, they have special software or code that they put in. And, it's, and you can't really recover from it because as soon as you know it's there, you're done. They're gone. They're not coming back. And this is just an example. This is kind of an older toolkit. But uh, you can see it's being sold on the darknet for about $4,000. Um, and um, there's a lot of kits out there. Uh, these kits actually come with playbooks that tell you, hey, this is uh, the manufacturer of the ATM. This is how you can double check before you install it. This is how to get to the USB uh, service key, uh, service port. Um, 
uh, a lot of them, like sometimes they're fully exposed and uh, you don't even have to like move the, move, move the ATM machine at all. I have asked ATM vendors like why they do this and they're like, hey, you know what? Like we're servicing these machines. They're not like te tech guys. They're not like IT security guys. We just need to update the machines. This is how we update them. So you, uh, you, know, you know, we were, we were dogging on them a few years ago for running Windows XP on all, all uh, ATM machines. They've kind of gone away from that, but this is how they update it to make things easier. But it makes attacks easier as well. Um, and as I said, uh, some things are really sophisticated. They'll come up with like cables and stuff, but honestly, it's really just about taking a USB stick, sometimes prepping it a little bit, like depending on what program you're buying, and then sticking it in the ATM machine. So um, not not too much. And these, like I said, these dark kits are available for sale like all the time. When I, when I first started off like as a, as a threat hunter, I used to have to go to all these onion sites and go on the Tor network and find like a lot of places where to find these attacks. They're all on the clear net now. Like they don't even try and hide themselves. You don't need any more special software to get to these sites. Yeah, sometimes you do need like different logins or different logins to different uh, you know parts of forums. And they're actually even moving away from that. In fact, this year I'm actually seeing more and more like uh, Telegram groups and and um, and WhatsApp private chat channels and stuff where these guys hang out at. And it doesn't take much to get access to it. Just a little bit of. Um, I would say patience and just perseverance. And then you're in these groups and you can just monitor what they're doing. And, and what are they doing in these groups, right? Well, first of all, there's a lot of credit cards in these groups. You can buy pretty much a credit card for, for um, you know, about $2 to $2 to $5 full credit card. They're selling them you know, in lots of like hundreds, uh, dozens at least, maybe hundreds, sometimes thousands. Um, people's identity, medical records. Um, I always think, like, why, why would someone want to buy a medical record? Like, if I'm, if I'm not famous, you, you're not going to really bribe me with a medical record. And I, and I asked some of these groups, like, hey, what's the value on the medical records? And they're like, think about it. They're like, a medical record has everything I need for your identity. It has your social security number, has your name, has everything. I don't need to steal a credit card. I can get my own loan by stealing your identity. And then also, I didn't realize how much of a big deal or how much money there is in medical fraud and just running insurance scams and things like that and this. There's also kits that walk you through the entire process on how to do that. Now, if you don't have money to buy these kits from the internet, uh, you, can, you, can, you can just buy money from the internet. That's, that's fun, too. Uh, uh, so, uh, and some of, this, some of this money is actually pretty... Uh, now, this is, this is older. In fact, this, this particular website is probably a scam website, but there are sites out there that do sell counterfeit money, and some of them do actually pass that black marker test to see if it's uh, you know, counterfeit money or not. Some of them, you can actually hold up to a light and see a little thread like you would tell people you know, to check for counterfeit money. So it's, um, it's pretty crazy, like I said, what's out there or not. Um, as I said, you can get someone's name, address, full credit card number, you know, the little verification code in the back, a Stripe clone, um, a full clone bypass, but most people are not actually going to be buying stuff physically with these. They usually buy things online. They normally look for an address that no one's really monitoring, maybe, maybe a house that hasn't been built before and just pick up the package or whatever. That's, that's normally how they're buying things. And as I said, this is outdated. Uh, it's, it's about $1.50 per card right now. That's, at least it was a couple of days ago and has been around that price for a couple of months. So how do attackers do this? You're like, okay, that's great, but how do attackers actually do this? Usually the first step in an attack that I see is a phishing attack. Now, by far, I think phishing attacks or some sort of email threat is kind of the number one vector most attackers go through. And I'm going to show you really how easy it is. There's a lot of toolkits out there that you can just download. In fact, this one you can get from GitHub. It's called the Black Eye um, Phishing Kit. Um, and there's, there's like lots of them available. There's like pro versions and different versions as well. And uh, you can download this one. I like this one because it's, it's kind of a fun one to show and demos and stuff. But um, you can see that in this particular one, I have a lot of templates. I can put in more templates. I can update templates. I'm going to pick in LinkedIn because everyone likes to send all their information to recruiters, right? <laughs> like, hey, I'm a recruiter. I, and stop right there. Here's all my info. Take everything you want. So in this case, uh, this generates a website for you. Uh, this would be the attacker's machine. Yes, you'd probably customize that website, make it look a little more realistic. But um, once I go to that website, it pretty much looks like LinkedIn. I think most people would get fooled, especially if I have a little more realistic website customized the, the actual domain. If I go to the real LinkedIn website, by the way, you can tell it is different. It's like a light theme versus a dark theme, a little bit of a difference. Most people are not going to notice. If I do care they notice, I can, update, I can update this easily. 
Now notice when I go to the fake one, it also has that little lockbox. That's what we tell our users, right? Look for that green lockbox and that way you're safe. This actually generated a certificate on the fly, a let's encrypt certificate. So you have that lockbox so you could all feel safe now putting in this password. <laughs> So uh, I actually did this to a coworker of mine. This was actually a live attack. Uh, he didn't know about it. And then I told him I'm going to use him in every presentation. And uh, <laughs> he's like, great. Um, it's, uh, my, my coworker's name is Jonas. And so you can see he's from Singapore. Uh, I see some IP information. I see his username, password, and see some other uh, information as well. Now, like I said, phishing attacks happen all the time. And it's funny how they, they uh, you know, are so good at like, uh, looking at what motivates us. Sometimes I, I feel like I get more news out of like, watching the latest phishing attacks, right? I go, oh, you know what? There, there, uh, there must be uh, you know, something happening in uh, Iran right now because I see all these phishing attacks around that or around elections or vaccines. They're going to pick whatever they think is like, going to motivate you to click on something, right? Like, uh, hey, uh, Thundercats are coming back. You know, I'll be like, oh, yeah, let me click on that. I love Thundercats, right? <laughs> and uh, so whatever they, this is going to motivate you, they, they're going to have a phishing attack on that. And don't think phishing attacks are just limited to emails. They're getting creative now, such as, of course, mobile devices and mobile applications as well. And starting to see phishing attacks on smart speakers, like your Google and Amazon devices. So how does that work, right? Well, a smart speaker basically uses a skill. That's an app on a smart speaker. Basically, it has a skill. So when you say, hey, there's no Alexas in here. So, hey, Alexa, um, tell, me, uh, tell me what the weather is tonight. So it looks in its database. It says, OK, I have an app or a skill called weather. And it's going to you know, tell you the weather, right? Well, people are registering skills that are, they can use for phishing. For example, if American Express has an app or a skill that you say, hey, American Express, tell me my balance. It's going to be smart enough to know, hey, I'm not going to tell you a balance out loud. Here's a secure link, and go check your balance. Now, what about if someone registers or sees Amex is not taken, and you say, hey, Alexa, <laughs> what is my Amex balance? It could say something like, your account's being hacked. Here's a link. Please look at this right away. Your account has been hacked. I don't know if you can hear that. Welcome to Amex. Your account has been hacked. Now, that, that issue has been fixed for Amex, but in this particular case, it actually sent a secure link. Depending on what device you were receiving it on, what device was registered to your Alexa account, if it was iOS or Android or even a desktop machine, it would give you the proper attack, <laughs> so uh, the most capable attack it wanted. Like I said, once users get on systems, um, they do a whole bunch of stuff. They usually will extra, uh, you know, take out data, explore data. data. Um, they'll kind of mess around, they'll land and expand. But usually, normally, the last step, I always get asked about ransomware. And I hate it when someone tells me, like especially a customer tells me, hey, I got ransomware. Because my thought is a lot of other things happened, probably a lot worse before you got ransomware. I normally find that most attackers, they'll um, execute the ransomware when they feel like they had nothing else of value from you. They're like, I've gotten everything I want from you, or, or if they feel like they're about to get caught. Like if you start doing some sort of investigation or incident response, and like, man, I got caught, let me execute the ransomware. Now, I'm finding a lot of people these days, and I don't know why the trend is changing, but I find a lot of people are like, starting to pay for ransomware. And um, here's an example. This is a real life example of this. I did actually take off some screenshots and change some things around just so we can identify the client that easily. But this is a ransom note that, um, that someone got. It says, please pay lots of Bitcoins after they got attacked. This was a hospital. It was a healthcare provider. And basically, they went on this darknet channel, and they said, hey, uh, we got hit by ransomware. Uh, we want to pay. Uh, what's, what's the deal? And basically, the threat actor said, pay us $10 million. Wow, $10 million. And they're like, wait, the note said we would get a special price if we contacted you early. Wow, I can't, I can't believe they were like, asking about a special price. They're like, <laughs> What's on the dollar menu, guys? <laughs> uh, so uh, they're like, guys, this is a special price. Because if you think about the lawsuits, your reputation, all this other stuff, you, you know, it's, it's going it's to probably cost you more. Then this is where negotiations happened. I had to take a couple of things out because they were identifying themselves pretty, pretty easily. But essentially, they settled on $4 million. They said, hey, we will pay you $4 million if we can get our, get our data back. Now, can you really trust these guys? The sad answer is yes, you can trust them because they never want you to hesitate. They don't want you to go on a forum and tell people, you know what, I paid these guys and I didn't get my data back. They want you to go on a forum and say, I paid these guys and I got my data back. So when the next guy gets attacked, they have no hesitation. 
So they ended up paying these guys, and you can even see, they even told them, guys, these are all the things you need to fix, by the way. This is all the things you did wrong. I've actually seen threat actors or these ransomware groups give reports, like PDF reports and HTML reports, that look better than pen testing companies that you pay thousands and thousands of dollars for. <laughs> these are like awesome, awesome reports, and they give you like samples and exactly everything what to do. Now, the sad part was this was open on the internet, and just like I found this, anyone can find this, including other threat actors. So you know, like, even though these guys are probably not going to hack this company again or attack them, other people can go back. They go like, I bet you they haven't fixed everything. I'm going to just attack them again. And you know what? Maybe they won't pay $4 million, but I bet you they won't even think twice about paying 100000 and I can do the exact same thing again. Now, you can see they, they actually left the lines of communication open. They're like, hey, you need anything else? We're good. You pay me $4 million, you'll get the best tech support. <laughs> I'll come hang your TV, like whatever you want, mop your floor. <laughs> now, how, how does this work? The one thing that I found like, pretty interesting is that most threats these days, um, they're, they're kind of run like, in botnets. Like When I first started off, a botnet was just like a program that used to attack other, other machines. It was like a denial of service attack. It used to do a few other things. Now, these days, botnets are actually kind of changing. Maybe, maybe we need to update the definition or something, because these days, botnets are almost like me, this is my term, a CDN, a content delivery network, where it just is basically a loader that, uh, that is a staging for other types of attacks. So I'm going to show you a quick, simple example of a botnet that you can also download on GitHub. You need to talk to Microsoft here, right? <laughs> so this is called Build Your Own Botnet, but I want to show you like, how sophisticated some of these, um, some of these uh, toolkits look like and how command and control look like. This is, this is really how it looks like. Now, this is the free version of this tool. There is a paid version of this tool or better tools out there as well. Um, so, uh, uh, so we're going to attack my friend Jonas again <laughs> because, you know, he's in Singapore. So just don't please attack random people from Singapore. They'll, they'll come against me. But uh, in this case, I have like basically executables or a Python script. In the paid version, I can actually do a lot more. I can do a VBS script. I can do a VBS script in an Office document. I can do PowerShell. I can do a lot of other things. But you know, this really was a demo, so I just kind of wanted to show you. We go back on the victim's machine, and uh, the, the victim has an executable. You'd probably get it for a phishing attack or something like that. Like I said, in real life, this would be an Office document. Um, I do have the ability to actually change the icons to make it look like an Office document, but I would, I would never run an exe um, in real life as an attack for this if, if I was an attacker. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you can see once I run this, it normally bypasses all their security, uh, perimeter security, and basically does a reverse shell back. Once I get the reverse shell back, I'll refresh the screen, and I see that uh, basically... Uh, Jonas is connected back to my control, command and control server. I have full shell access to a system. I can do other things. I can install more software. I can escalate privileges. I can do, um, you know, turn on his webcam, put on a key logger. I have a couple of scripts that automatically do that or will attempt to do that automatically for me. But uh, at the very end, maybe I'll just install software and give him some ransomware. So a, a, lot, of, a lot of different options that are, that, are, that are available. Now, I always ask myself, like, hey, um, you know, you know, like, why isn't this stuff being, like, stopped? Like, why is it so hard to stop this stuff? And um, like I said, it's, uh, you know, we don't have time to talk about. This could be, like, a two-hour discussion. But what I'm finding is most of this stuff is, like, hard to catch because, for the most part, attackers are using systems that already exist. They're using, like, routers, IoT devices. They're not creating anything new. That used to be kind of the old-school way. That used to be, like, three, four years ago. They used to, like, kind of, like, create new attacks. Now these days they're like, hey, let me try and steal credentials through phishing attacks, and then once I steal your credentials, I'm going to dump your AD, and then I'm going to, like, get, you know, figure out where your, uh, you know, remote desktops are, and then just get on your systems. And I'm going to use tools that are already in your environment, like PowerShell and other tools. I'm going to create an FTP server, get the data out, uh, you know, upload data. I'm going to try and not touch disk with any new type of uh, programs because as soon as you touch disk, that's normally where AV programs like turn off and or leak, and uh, and so it makes it a lot easier for them. They have to think about it a little more, but it makes it a lot easier not to get caught because when I take and this is just an example, when I just take a look at like top operating systems that were compromised and you take a look at multiple lists, you see a lot of routers on there, home routers, everyone's working from home, right? Uh, you see a lot of IoT devices, you see a lot of other devices because people are just like figuring out, hey, what operating system is vulnerable and let me get on that and use the existing land. We call that in pen testing, living off the land sometimes. Um, 
but uh, that's essentially what it is. Now, I'm going to kind of skip a few slides here, and just because we're kind of getting short on time, I just wanted to show you uh, before, because I always used to wonder, um, hey, Amar, you call yourself a threat hunter. What the heck does that mean? What does a threat hunter really do, right? I just kind of wanted to show you, like, my life as a threat hunter, what I do. And, of course, this will be automated uh, in, in, in this example, but I'm going to show you basically ransomware. This is... This is a real ransomware that I've just changed a little bit, but normally you have your ransomware, you have ransom code normally embedded, or it's a downloader or something like that. And then, of course, I'm going to have some files, and my files could be anything. In this case, they're just like test files, nothing really important, but of course, I could have pictures, I could have office documents, I could have uh, you know, movies, any, anything I want. In this case, they're just like test documents. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run the ransomware, and normally when I run the ransomware, I get a ransom note. Ransom note is the note that says, please pay lots and lots of Bitcoins. Um, I actually had to change this no demo because I had a real Bitcoin address in there and people were sending Bitcoins. Like, don't do that. Don't send Bitcoins <laughs> to attackers. Uh, so, but, uh, so now I just have this shady address. Uh, that won't work if you try and sell, send me Bitcoins there. Um, so, uh, but uh, sometimes it does some fancier stuff. It'll change the desktop. Maybe it won't even make anything available, just a ransom note. Um, and then usually all your files are encrypted. You can't get to any of your files anymore. And usually wherever you have files, you usually see the ransom note there too. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually put this through the Cuckoo Sandbox. The Cuckoo Sandbox, I mean, there's a lot of devices. At Fortnite, we have the 40 Sandbox as well, but this is an open source Sandbox. And what it does is it actually tells me what the behavior of the file is. It tells me, like, the IOCs of the file, the indicators of compromise. Basically, that's what is all the bad things that make bad, right? It basically shows me, hey, this is when the file was run all the way down to the very bottom when Notepad was opened and it showed me the ransom text. If I go into a little more detail, it's going to show me, hey, these are all the registry entries that were dropped or changed or modified. These are all the network connections that happened. All these different IOCs, all the little bad things. So as a threat hunter, one of the things that I do is I try and separate these out, and I put them in a database. So I'm going to put them in a database. In this case, I'm using the MISP database, but you can really use any database you want. And I'm just going to store all these individual IOCs in a database. I'm storing them, putting them in an event called 1406, just so I can reference them later. Then I'm going to start examining some of these IOCs and see how they relate to another. So I'm going to use this other tool called Maltigo. Has, has anyone used Maltigo? A few people, yeah. I love Maltigo. It's one of my favorite tools, mostly just because of how it displays information. So I'm going to tell Maltigo, look at event 1406. Now, I'm not discovering anything new at this point. I'm not, doing, and I'm not really doing any threat hunting at this point. I'm just telling Maltigo, show me what Cuckoo found out about. But uh, I just want to look at it in a, different, in a, in a little different way, and uh, mostly just because it just shows it to me in a way that I can kind of manipulate a little more. So uh, let's go ahead and run the set here, and we'll go ahead and see what Maltigo tells me. And it's basically going to come back and say, wow, these are all the IOCs in your database, you know, including the IP addresses that were connected to. If I had the Bitcoin addresses readable, it would pull that out, the Bitcoin addresses. It would pull out all these other things. So like, great, I have just have another report. So what else can I do here, right? And normally what I do, and like I said, this is from usually, in this case, it would be automated, but I'm going to say, what else is related? Do I have anything in my database that's related to these events? Do I have like any other events or attacks that happen that have the same IP addresses, maybe the same Bitcoin addresses, other things of that nature? And that's where I get my start, is figuring out like who did the attack, where did it come from, maybe start tracing it a little more. And then it's just a whole bunch of detective, or detective work and really just following the patterns to see where you can find the earliest pattern and like what was the group who started talking about that group first. Hey, you know, are they, uh, you know, was it like Fin6 or did someone call it Fin8 at this point because they, they uh, found out something new about this group and when did that happen and just examining a lot of that stuff. So in essential, that's what threat hunting is and that's what you do as a threat hunter. Um, plus a lot more stuff like... Uh, uh, my boss is here, so I just don't want him to think that's all I do. <laughs> I do lots of other important stuff, too. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just uh, end with one last thing since I got one minute left, is I'll just say, you know, in cybersecurity, it's, it's really about understanding where your weak points are and where your visibility is. And I like the story from World War II because it's a, it's a good story. During World War II, the British, um, British Air Force was being decimated by, by uh, anti-German gunfire. 
And someone said, you know what? We got to protect our planes. We have to protect our Air Force. So they're like, you know what? Let's put a lot of armor around this. Like our planes will protect them, right? We'll just heavily, heavily fortify them. And that's kind of what we sometimes do in cybersecurity. We're like, let's just buy a whole bunch of stuff and hope it works. But that's not how it works in real life. And, it, and you know, someone said, like, guys, we can't just do this on our planes because the planes won't fly. They'll be too heavy. They won't be maneuverable. So, of course, they said, you know what? Let's, let's be strategic about it. Let's actually look at where the weak spots are. And where are the weak spots? Well, they're like, well, where, where are all the bullet holes? Those are where those weak spots are. So that's where they're getting shot at. And they're like, that makes sense. And when we think about cybersecurity, we're like, where am I failing? My users are failing phishing attacks. Let me like, invest in that. Uh, you know, I'm failing compliance. Let me invest in that. It sounds great. But, but I like this saying because uh, you know, there was, a, there was a, uh, you know, a famous mathematician, and he, got, he said, guys, you're looking at all the planes that made it back. What happened to the planes that didn't make it back? What happened to the planes where you can't actually count the bullet holes? Where were those weak spots? And that's what we have to look at, right? We have to figure out where are the real weak spots? What are the problems that we don't know about? Um, the way I figure that out personally is I try and do a lot of trading. There's a lot of stuff available, um, and this is all free. Everything that I'm showing you is like free, like training.fortnite.com. I love to hack the box. If you do hack the box for like six months, right, you'll be a better pen tester than probably like, uh, you know, 15.4% uh, of the people I know. <laughs> so, no, actually, you will be really good. It's, it's really, like, some of the stuff is really difficult and really hard. Uh, it's free. You, if you pay for the paid version, like, I have no affiliation with this, you, you get access to older boxes people have solved, right? Uh, we have a ton of training available on training.fortnite.com. I actually had my mom go for, like, a level one, and she's like, I get it. I, and she's like, yeah, you, you, like, I go, what do you mean? She's like, you're not a doctor. You're Indian, but you're not a doctor. I finally get it. I was like, man, I tried, mom. I tried. <laughs> All right, well, I will leave you with that. Uh, a lot of good stuff. I'll be around afterwards, and thank you. Appreciate your time.